Good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network's BRN Sunday podcast where members of the media, academia, and financial services talk about all the issues related to retirement markets, technology, personal finance, and so much more. We've got another great show for you this week. We've got a very special guest. We're joined by Jack Kozakowski. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Junior Achievement. We're going to be talking about financial literacy and what JA is doing in that realm. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the BRN Sunday Podcast. Yeah. Well, let's kick things off with a look at the latest social media trends. And uh, joining me now is the Senior Financial Services Editor for LinkedIn. He's also the editor of the This Week in Finance newsletter, which you can find on the LinkedIn platform, Mr. Devin Banerjee. Hey, Devin. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. It's just uh, been a busy week. Um, yeah. As you're aware, markets go up, markets go down, lots of volatility. <laughs> got the coronavirus. Um, we've got uh, elections, primaries. We've got things <laughs> going on across the globe. Uh, I'm sure things happening across the universe. Uh, but <laughs> we always start our show off with a discussion uh, from your perspective on what some of the hottest trend stories are on the platform. So lay it on us, my friend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have a great view uh, on LinkedIn of what people are talking about, what uh, news items are really trending. But yeah, it was a busy week, crazy week. I was just joking with my wife um, this morning that Super Tuesday was just this past week. It feels like it was a month ago. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to start with some, some more newsy items uh, mm-hmm. today than I usually do. The first is a really, really strong jobs report out on Friday. Now, of course, this was Um, for the month of February before the effects of the coronavirus really started spreading. But I think it really points to just how closely everyone is watching uh, these ripple effects of the coronavirus because the jobs market was so strong leading up to this month. So in February, payrolls jumped uh, by 273,000, really, really blowing expectations out of the water. Um, Transportation, hospitality, services, employers, those are the ones that have since announced in March uh, a real hit to their business due to the virus. Uh, so those are the, um, the the industries, the parts of the economy that, that people are watching most closely now. Um, and uh, the labor market is still tight, at least as of uh, February. Un- unemployment was at 3.5%. That's still, you know, that half century low. Um, so, yeah, really, really strong jobs report. Now, of course, it's backward looking. But again, it just uh, points out uh, how closely people are going to be watching the effects of this virus. And uh, speaking of the effects of this virus, another story that really uh, a lot of people were uh, looking at and uh, conversing about on the platform is uh, the travel industry, which obviously was one of the first industries, um, you know, business areas to start taking a hit uh, as the virus effects began spreading globally. Um, some new forecasts came out this past week showing the uh, the worst is actually still yet to come for airlines, probably. Um, so the International Air Transport Association came out and said uh, they now see airlines losing up to $113 billion in revenue this year. Um, that's almost four times worse than uh, that same association projected just two weeks ago. So it kind of points to how quickly this uh, coronavirus threat is evolving and um, how much uncertainty there is around it right now. Yeah. I mean, I think I know a lot of people are worried and, and, and not just worried from a health perspective, but worried right. from a financial health per, health perspective. And there's just so many unknowns. I mean, we don't know honestly how many cases there are I and mean, we get numbers from the U S we get numbers around the globe, but they are a little bit more secluded you know, or numbers from secluded uh, countries like yeah. China and others where they're not, you know, so there's a lot of unknowns. And I, I don't think we know, honestly, how this, anyone who tells you that they know what's going to happen, you know, right. I've seen a lot of papers, Deb, and I've seen a lot of white papers and a lot of opinions, but, you know, we all, opinions are like, you know why we can't say it on this program. Um, yeah. But I, 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 you know, I, I just feel like we just don't know. We're going to have to see things where things wind up. But I can tell you just anecdotally that, Obviously, earnings are going to be hit. We've seen reports from Apple, the supply chain, yeah. other areas. I mean, expectations have to be muted or dampened at least. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and back to the, I mean, the travel industry and airline industry, that's the one that is immediately and materially affected by that uncertainty. So a lot of cancellations going on. The airlines are <clears throat> paying out a lot in refunds. The stocks are tanking. We actually saw the first uh, airline uh, go bankrupt. It's a budget airline in the UK called Flybe, um, just uh, folded folded shop um, due to this massive hit it's taken the past couple of weeks. So definitely that more immediate uh, material impact for the travel industry. So definitely keep worth keeping an eye on. Um, another thing in the news this week that I found really interesting, not virus related, and we talked about this um, on the network uh, late last week, is on Monday last week, the SEC came out um, asking for public comment around fund naming, investment fund naming and called out ESG funds in particular, which um, actually to date have not been held to the same standards as as other mutual and uh, exchange traded funds, which when they have keywords in their names, those other funds, they're they're held to uh, a standard of investing in asset classes and securities related to those keywords. So if a fund has stock or equity in the name, it generally more than 80% of the fund needs to be in that asset class. So I was kind of personally surprised that ESG funds were not held to this standard, to be honest, but the SEC is uh, now taking public comments on that. And uh, I thought that was a really interesting development. As you and I discussed on the network, it points to a couple things, but one is uh, just the maturation of this this ESG space. Um, You know, it's, it's being taken seriously now. Regulators are considering safeguards Um, I mean, we've seen inflows into ESG funds at at a record pace, about 20% uh, compound annual growth rate the past couple of years. So I thought that was really interesting. And uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. Yeah, that's that's one that I think uh, so, so much of uh, always thinking about. I think the SEC here is thinking about the, you know, the average investor, as we talked about on the network. And and, um, so much of what happens in terms of investing is uh, people look at the brand names. I mean, they look at the names yep. on the prospectus. They look at the name on the fund fact sheet, and they, they do draw a conclusion. Now, that being said, I mean, usually every prospectus, I think every manager tra- in traditional asset classes tries to manage to the mandate. But there are times, Devin, when you know, look at private equity as an example, where they have a, how much cash do they have sitting on the yeah. sidelines right now where they cannot invest in opportunities because there's just not enough opportunities there. I think that's something that needs to be disclosed, needs to be more transparent. As it relates to ESG, we talked about it uh, yesterday uh, or today. Well, we talked about it yesterday, but it's on today's show. We're, t- we're recording this on a Friday, just so there's no secrets here, full transparency. <laughs> um, but, you know, th- there are so many different flavors of ESG and it mer- yeah. very different meaning. But I, I think this is really critical um, you can't just take anything on face value. You really got to do your due diligence here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just, uh, it's all about transparency, really. I mean, um, you know, there's been this fear and I think some 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 evidence of uh, what people call greenwashing, which is uh, funds slapping on the ESG label or, or title in, in the name or somewhere in the summary prospectus and kind of riding this trend of the asset owners, the pools of capital, looking for places to allocate that money, you know, taking advantage of their interest in, in ESG. So I think it's an important development. You know, I'm not uh, personally, you know, a huge pro-regulation guy, but sometimes when it comes down to naming and, and basic marketing, as you said, uh, it's it's probably an important development. I'm not a, I'm um, not a, I'm not a big yeah. regulation guy. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm not a big relation, <laughs> regulation guy either, but I do think that the regulation should be around transparency so that and, and do it because let me give, give an example like the two, the 2012 fee disclosure rules. And I always go back to that because I think it's as easy to point yeah. out where that was done with the right intent. But when you read right. that thing, it's like it, it comes with like a glossary of like, you know, 10 pages of terms. Right. I mean, and that that who's going to read that? No one's going to read that. Yeah. So if you're going to have transparency and give people information so they can discern whether or not it truly is a large cap fund or it truly is a private equity fund or whatever, you know, make it understandable, make it readable. And I think this is an example where you can't over rely. I love lawyers, especially when they're protecting me not, uh, or defending me, but you, you cannot, you know, you cannot let that just dictate what we put on these disclosures and what we put in these perspectives. Cause I think 
you know, it just it just doesn't do any good. You just wind up creating reams of paper, actually hurting exactly. the environment that the ESG <laughs> funds are trying to prevent. Oh, prevent. good point. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying. Yeah, no, I, I I think we're on the same. I think we're on the same page. You know, smart regulation um, and not just more regulation. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Um, last thing I'll sneak in quickly. We did some important research here at LinkedIn this past week. Um, looked at about 60 jobs where we're starting to see the hiring trend flip to majority women. So uh, jobs that used to be, you know, traditionally male dominated, the majority of people coming into these roles were men. Now flipping women. So we saw this in 23 jobs that we studied out of about 58. Just the top ones I'll mention, uh, retail operations, graphic production, <clears throat> actually medical officers, dental technicians. Um, so I, I won't go down the full list, obviously, but you can check out my colleague George Anders's piece on that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of interesting data points. And, you know, backing up the overall um, U.S. government data that shows that women actually now account for a majority of actual job holders in management, professional service, and sales jobs. But that uh, rate of hiring is uh, also benefiting them in about uh, two dozen jobs right now. Interesting. Well, I guess more to come on that and always a reason why yep. people should check out the data, uh, check out uh, This Week in Finance, but also the data that uh, LinkedIn is doing on behalf of the I don't know, membership is the right word or the behalf yeah, of the platform. Exactly. Yeah, about 700 million people. And we, you know, at an aggregate le level, we see really uh, interesting hiring trends and skills trends and, uh, you know, geographic trends, all of that. Yeah. Well, uh, well, always a pleasure talking with you, Devin. Thanks so much for kind of getting us started on the week and uh, weekend, I should say. And we look forward to chatting with you again next week. Absolutely. Take care, Joe. Thanks, bud. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Now, time to talk a little technology. And joining me on the line, Senior Technology and Consumer Products Reporter with The Motley Fool, Mr. Daniel Klein. Hi, Dan. Welcome back to the program. Oh, hey there, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Obviously, a, trip, a lot of trepidation, a lot of nervousness in terms of the market and the coronavirus. But um, always interested in getting your take on tech. Dan's take on tech. That's what we should call <laughs> this segment. Finally, after two years, we're going to call it that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a uh, it's been kind of a turn the TV off sort of week if you uh, if you're someone who has some money in the stock market. Oh, I would say yeah, definitely. I would say it's going to be that way. A lot of volatility, having people nervous. But um, as you and I always talk about, both here and on the television network, it's that long term investing horizon that you need to be cognizant about and thinking about these short term blips, even if they're significant. You need to put that aside. The, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say one thing because this isn't our topic today. Right. But if you believe in a company, if its fundamentals are good, it will recover from whatever is going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really good point. And we will – I forget the name of the, uh, the, the group, but we will survive. I will survive, right? Um, <laughs> it's a Gloria Gaynor. That's right. Or the Grateful Dead, I will survive, right? Um, okay, so Dan, let's talk a little tech. Let's shift gears. Let's get people a little distracted from – what's going on, and to focus on some other key issues. What can you tell us? What's top of mind for you this week? So let's talk about social media. Twitter has decided it's going to have a policy where it doesn't let people denigrate other people based on a handful of things, uh, ethnicity, size, I forget what the others are. But this is basically Twitter opening a door it hadn't been willing to open before in terms of policing content. And it's not going to punish users for past content, but it will take things down if flagged. And the problem here is these standards become a lot like pass interference in the NFL. <laughs> it's a little different to everybody. It's very hard to know what it is. And without getting too political, the number one Twitter user is the president someone who really likes to insult people on Twitter, and he's been kind of given a pass about any policies. So uh, one of my colleagues sort of talked about this all, actually on Twitter, and he said he'd rather they used Facebook's policy of pretty much doing nothing instead of having something that's pretty much designed to disappoint people. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the pass interference 
but it is a really good analogy, right? Because I think they, they you know, a lot of those ticky tack penalties don't get called. Sometimes they do get called. They get called at different points in time in the game. They can have an impact, a negative impact to the game. Um, you know, I, I always was taught the golden rule: do unto others as you have you expect them to do unto you, right? I mean, that is what we learned as as children. And, uh, you know, I try to follow that and, um, you know, I won't try to draw first blood and I really won't engage in any type of that social media stuff. I got too much other important stuff in my life to do that. But, um, you know, when you, when you, Dan, when you get these, pol- you start creating policies and you think about all these if or thens and all these kind of things, that's really hard to police. It really it, is hard, right? It's very hard to police. And, and so my personal policy on social media is I've stopped engaging with people who are trying to pick a fight. And in my personal feed, where I do post political leaning things, if I post something political and you respond, even if you agree with me and you put up a, a meme and it's it's just meant to make fun of the other side, I immediately mute that. I want conversation. There's absolutely political debate. Uh, like right now, many of my very liberal New England friends do not understand why Elizabeth Warren did not get more votes. And there's an interesting debate there around whether it was sexist, whether it was her policies, whether it's how she carries herself, whether we judge her how she carries herself for sexist reasons. And that's an interesting debate that I'm perfectly happy to have on my social feed, social media feeds. But that can also easily go into a bad direction. Mm -hmm. So I'm personally very careful about what I allow people to post and sort of control the conversation. But if you're Twitter, uh, and I'll give you an example to, to cite the president who continually referred to Mike Bloomberg, one of his possible opponents who has since dropped out, as mini Mike Bloomberg. Well, that's denigrating him based on his size, which would violate the new Twitter policy. Is Twitter going to do anything about that? I would argue they're not going to. So why say you have a policy that's only going to apply to some people? It puts you in a position to to go back to the NFL, look like you have different referees calling different games that have different standards. Yeah, you know, yeah. to to further the sports analogy, this is the strike zone. Oh, that's where I was going. That's where I was going. I mean, you read my mind, and I think I, I think number one, it's really hard to figure out what people's intent is, right? So you're going back to, and I'm not. I don't want to really go down the whole political thing, but if someone posts something as to why someone didn't elect somebody, I think it's really hard to figure out what Dan Klein is thinking inside unless you act actively or the voter is thinking. I think that's really hard. And I think when you go bring up you bring up the strike zone, right? So the it's supposed to be from the shoulders to the waist, right? That is the right, that's the strike zone. Is that right? In, in I that? believe that's correct. Okay. So if a ball goes there, it should be a strike. And what often confuses hitters and again it's a judgment thing. It's really hard I would imagine being an umpire and a ball's thrown even 80 miles an hour, but if it's thrown 100 miles an hour, it got to be really hard. You're looking over someone's shoulder really hard, but that is that is by definition the strike zone. And anything to the left, the right, top or bottom, isn't a strike. I think that confuses hitters. The same thing with these ticky tacky. You, know, you grab a jersey, Dan. You grab a jersey. That should be pass interference. Now the umpire has to see it, or the referee has to see it, right? But at the end of the day, that is pass, pass interference. So I think you have to be very clear, just my opinion, very clear on what is constitutes good, bad, and what – you know. I think it's hard to monitor is my point. Yeah, and intent is very tricky. So we, we all have friends that might have a nickname that's related to their size. Maybe it's a tall guy and his nickname is Stretch. Is that being used derisively? Is it complimentary? Is it just what it is? And I think it becomes very difficult to interpret that. Now, yeah. obviously, Twitter and Facebook should be policing for hate speech, for bullying. There should be a method to report things. But when you start to lay out specific criteria that very clearly they're not going to enforce for everyone, yeah. it, it becomes very difficult. And again, I'd like to see some sort of industry third-party standard, like an OSHA for social media, come up with a policy that sort of every company lives with and maybe pays a third party to deal with. I'm not sure Twitter should be making these decisions because let's pretend, and, and I'll pick someone on the other end of the political spectrum, let's pretend Alec Baldwin is offending people who don't believe the same way he does. Mm. Who should be deciding on that? Twitter, which benefits from all the, the action he creates, 
or a third party, sort of an impartial party that might say, hey, well, this is wrong. It violates the agreed upon industry policy, so we should move on from this. Yeah, well, actually, he offends me because of his acting, not because of his uh, – <laughs> I'm just kidding. I liked him in uh, the Jack Ryan movie. I thought that was one of his best acting performances as Jack Ryan. Hey, I'll uh, watch Three Rock anytime. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Watch uh, – what? 30 Rock. Oh, yeah. I never really – never really watched that, but he is, he is kind of funny. Uh, and a really, and he was an amazing actor. Um, all right, Dan, what else is going on? I know you want to talk about. Uh, we talk social media, but you, you can't talk social media without talking phones and devices, right? <laughs> yeah. So Apple very quietly said to some of its vendors that there may be a shortage of iPhones. And I'm not bringing this up to pick on Apple. I'm just sort of bringing this up to talk about some of the fallout of the coronavirus. You're going to see for the next three, six, maybe even longer months, disruptions in supply chain mm. and disruptions in stores. So Apple makes a lot of its iPhones in China. If people can't go to work in China, there's going to be a slowdown in iPhones. Now, that's a demand that's likely to catch up. If you need a new phone and you have to wait a little bit for it, you still need a new phone. Or maybe you'll buy a Samsung, but you're going to buy a phone. App, uh, Starbucks had to close 85% of its stores in China, or actually has, I think they've said that 85% are back open. I may be getting that number wrong, but they had major disruptions. Now, your cup of coffee, if I don't drink a cup of coffee Wednesday, I'm probably not going to have three on Friday. So <laughs> some, some sales Maybe are you don't get lost. sleep. Right. That's yeah. Right. And you're going to see in the U.S., like I was supposed to go to a trade show in a couple weeks. That trade show has been pushed to September. That's going to create airline and hotel demand in September, but there's obviously going to be a softness in March. Now, my airfare for that trip was not refundable, so mm. and the change fee is more than what I paid. So if that airline does not decide to offer a sort of mercy – and it was a very low fare, so I'm not overly concerned about it. If they don't decide to make a change and say, hey, you can change their, their fare – they're going to, one, incur some ill will, but their revenue may not be overly down in the short term, but a few weeks out, nobody's booking airfare. Uh, you're going to see hotels, airfare, certain products not available, and these are going to be minor disruptions, but they will impact stock prices. And I would argue that at some point, coronavirus will go away and people will go back to Las Vegas. Honestly, I think I may still go to Las Vegas because I have this airfare and my room was comped. So maybe I'll go enjoy a show or something at a time when the casinos are going to be empty. But you should expect that there's going to be disruptions. Now, if you're a healthy person with no pre-existing conditions that doesn't have a baby or an elderly person in his house, I'm not overly worried about travel. Maybe I'll get coronavirus. Maybe I'll get the flu. But for the most part, I'm not in a risk group. So approach all of this with sort of a very measured take. Well, I think you bring up a good point. And number one, Dan, do you think your gambling is going to improve? Your chances for gambling will improve with people being or do you think it will be worse? No, just... um, I, I, I think the table odds, not odds, but – you're more likely to find $10 blackjack. You're more likely to find a table with people you want to play with as opposed to one that has a seat. Certainly, restaurants will have better deals if they're less crowded. Right. Um, I was already getting my room comped, and to get a room comped in March uh, when you have, uh, you know, it's a little bit before March Madness, but that's usually a time where rooms are kind of expensive in Vegas. So there was already a little bit of seasonal softness. Um, but yeah, there's going to be tickets to everything. If I want to go see Lady Gaga, I'm guessing it will be a lot easier. I don't, but if I did, <laughs> well, she's a great performer. But do you think she's actually going to be performing? I guess she will because she has a contractual commitment. I think you bring up um, that was more rhetorical, but I mean, I think you bring up some really interesting points. And these, this is the damage or the impact to the broader economic situation across the globe, right? Because you, you, what, you, what we started talking about was supply chain. That supply chain impacts Apple, right? It's going to impact other organizations, other other companies, other types of companies. You already mentioned the airlines. All this is going to have an impact that we're going to see for quarters to come, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, look, you have Microsoft and Amazon telling employees to work from home because Seattle has been particularly hard hit with coronavirus. Uh, my company, The Motley Fool, has been doing tests where we're testing our capacity for people to work from home. 
But when you work from home, not every person can do their job. Um, we produce a lot of television or, or, or video in a studio. We can do some of that remotely, but it doesn't involve all the same personnel. So there's going to be disruptions in people's workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, some things like shipping. You might get, uh, you know, say in the Seattle area, maybe FedEx says, hey, look, we have to close for a few days because we don't want our workers coming in. Well, those will have to be sent someplace else or routed elsewhere, and some things will sit in the warehouse. That hasn't happened yet, but it could happen. Obviously, you're gonna have goods that don't get made because there's delays in factories. Then you're gonna have delays moving things around. Then you might have you might have mall closures for a period of time. You might have kids who don't go to school for weeks at a time. This is unprecedented in the United States. I don't remember this ever happening, but this will be disruptive in the way that a major blizzard or hurricane is disruptive, and maybe for a longer period of time. Or maybe not, but right now it's leaning towards that's what's going to happen. Yeah, very, very good points. Well, Dan, always a pleasure talking with you, and I'm looking forward to exploring some of this on the television network on Tuesday. So I'm looking forward to have you actually being able to see you and talk about this a little bit more. Well, wash your hands. I, my hands are being washed right now. Can you hear? All right, Dan, take care. <laughs> I'll see you later. Bye. Yeah. Welcome back, and we have a very special guest show today and joining me now is Jack Kozakowski. He is the president and chief executive officer at Junior Achievement USA. Jack, thanks for joining us on the program today. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure and, and, and I really, uh, part of the reason why I reached out to you um, was the great work that Junior Achievement is doing with so many of our young people today. Um, but before we kind of get into the work that you're doing, not you, but your team are doing around the United States in financial literacy, let's let's just discuss who Junior Achievement is. So would you would you mind just just talking briefly about the organization, how many members, every, all that kind of good information? Sure, be happy to. Uh, you know, we're one of those organizations that are, everybody's heard our name, but a lot of people really don't understand what we do. Uh, we are the nation's largest and oldest economic organization for young people. Our official mission is to inspire and prepare young people to succeed in a global economy. And so in order to do that, we focus really on three key areas, uh, one being financial literacy, which is probably more important than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, the second, work and career readiness, which is also very important. Uh, and the third is entrepreneurship. And so uh, here in the United States, we reach about 4.8 million wow. K-12 students uh, annually. And uh, we do that. One of the, the secret sauce of junior achievement is that we have over a quarter of a million volunteers. Most of those come from the business community mm -hmm. uh, who go in to volunteer their time to really breathe life into the content that we have developed and lead the students through real life activities that drive home some of the points and develop the competencies uh, that we're looking to develop in these young people. That's absolutely amazing. And I mean, being able to impact almost 5 million students um, from the time, you know, they're, they're very young through probably through graduation, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's all different ages, all different grades. That is correct, yes. And, um, you know, just kind of looking over just the, the footprint of JA, I mean, you've got 106 different offices located around the United States, um, basically every civic area around the country, right? I mean, urban that, and suburban. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we are urban schools, suburban schools, rural schools. Uh, we, our delivery model is such that, you know, we have the feet on the street, so to speak, that can really reach out to nearly every community in the country. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, so let's talk financial literacy. And before we kind of get into the, the the blueprint of how you do what you do, which is amazing on the on behalf of all of with all the volunteers and the support of the business community, which obviously is very important. Um, would you mind talking about just kind of some of the methodology that you use? You know how you developed. Not, not you, but the team developed sure. this this uh, blueprint. 
Yeah, we use a very uh, hands-on approach uh, to learning. I mean, unlike what the students are learning in school about managing money, if they're learning anything, mm -hmm. uh, ours takes on a very practical approach, things that are age relevant. So, you know, what we're teaching young people about handling money in kindergarten is much different than what we're teaching to seniors in high school. So we make sure that the content and the activities are age appropriate. And one of the things that we try to do in all of our programs is utilize a behavioral model that promotes uh, self-efficacy. You know, we use the terminology that we try to take students from a mindset of I can't to I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the activities that they're doing, the reinforcements that they're getting from uh, those business volunteers uh, really get them to that point where they have the confidence that they can actually do what they need to do. And how much is mentorship? I know when I was growing up and even today, mentorship is important for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm middle aged, but that doesn't mean that I don't need direction. How important is it to have the mentorship of peers, but also uh, you know, people from the business community, people who are almost like older big brothers, big sisters who are guiding and reinforcing what parents are also doing at home? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, we think it's critical. When we do surveys, and I've been doing this for over 40 years now, the one consistency throughout the years is that when it comes to managing money and how to do budgets and so on, the first person that students tell us they go to are their parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so so the parent is the original role model for those students. But we're stuck in a cycle where many adults are not comfortable managing their money because they never received any kind of formal or even informal training in budgeting and managing money. So when these young people go to their parents, many parents, uh, I refer to it as the new birds and the bees talk. <laughs> you know, they, they just get very uncomfortable uh, about it and tend to push it off to somewhere else. And so, you know, the next place kids go is to their teachers. And again, I would say many teachers aren't prepared to have that conversation. So having somebody that has actually been successful in managing money and that can talk to them at a level that, that they understand, uh, that kind of mentorship is just gold. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that drives home uh, to these young people that, hey, not only do I know what to do, but because this guy is doing it and he believes in me, I can do it. Yeah, I, I, it sounds absolutely amazing. And I know in, in about a month and a half, I'm going to have the, the privilege of uh, attending one of your events through an organization called the National Association of Government Defined Contribution Administrators, or we call it NAGDA for short. We're doing a, an event in D.C., and we're actually oh, going to be attending that. So I'm really looking forward to that. Jack, have you ever thought um, – you know, financial literacy, as, we, as you mentioned, is a big – issue in this country, so much so that we have uh, you know, the federal government, states, other entities really looking at how to get people learning and thinking about saving and planning and budgeting, all these things. But have you ever thought – I know you're reaching almost 5 million or more um, children or K-12 through students. Have you ever thought of expanding to help reinforce this with, with parents or offering a, a parental course or – older brothers or older sisters that may be in, at universities or colleges? Have you ever thought of – or is that or is that just maybe too much of the population to handle? You would need to build more infrastructure for that. Well, that's a good question, and we've had these conversations over the years. And, of course, resources are limited. Yeah. So we're reaching in the K-12 population about 8.7% uh, of the students in the country. And uh, when we start talking about reaching out to parents, uh, of course – our boards and funders start questioning, well, why don't you just do a better job with the kids? Now, with that said, I'll tell you what happens naturally, uh, and I can give you example after example, especially in um, central city type communities where the students will get the information that through their JA experience in school, and they're actually taking it home and teaching their parents. Mm. Uh, this is especially true in immigrant families where they're unbanked 
And because of an experience that one of our students has, they actually have the confidence to go home and talk to mom or dad uh, and, and help them, uh, you know, get bank. So, uh, yeah, I think long term uh, getting to the parents in a practical way, because clearly nobody else seems to be doing it, um, is something that they'll be on our radar, but we want to make sure that we're reaching these young people. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, I'm not, to suggest, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Obviously, you guys have been extremely yeah. successful. How much, uh, you know, a lot of the kids today use technology. I'm, you know, I'm talking to you via Skype. I'm using my laptop. I have my phone next to me. How much is of the curriculum is technology-based versus just you know, human interaction? I mean, or is it a, is it a healthy mix? Because I, I would imagine that a lot of kids are continuously using their devices, and that's a good way to interact with people. But the human aspect of this, uh, that doesn't go away either. No, th- that's true. And uh, this is an issue that we've been dealing with for several years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, is you know integrating technology that that's where the kids are. I mean, their face is always in a mobile device of some <laughs> sort or a computer, uh, and so we've slowly but surely uh, been moving over our programs into when we're in school, we're using a blended learning approach, uh, and so much of that content uh, is delivered really twenty four seven to the kids uh, via the web. But uh, even more recently, right now, uh, we have under development working with some partners in the fintech industry, uh, apps that these kids can go to to learn about managing money, actually earn some cash while they're doing it, and then have opportunities to invest those funds, uh, whether it's in fractional shares of stock or a, a more traditional savings account and those sorts of things. So. Once again, I think we're bringing that real life to the kids uh, and in trying to infuse more and more of that technology. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, so when I was a younger person, uh, probably in fifth grade, I went to a school in ba- – I'm from Baltimore originally. And sure. uh, we had in – our, in our school, we actually had a um, – uh, we actually had a currency. So we used poker chips. Um, we didn't know they were poker chips, but they, they had yeah. different colors and – we, we weren't gambling. I want to reassure my parents we were not gambling in fifth grade or anybody listening. But we used poker chips, and we all had to have a job, and we had like a bank, and the, there were different denominations. And I can't tell you how much I learned from that, and it was reinforced through my parents. You know, we, did, we had all this interaction. We had to submit uh, an invoice to go to the bank. You could make deposits. You could have your own business. Um, but, you know, when I come, came home, my parents were able to reinforce that. And it just it just strikes me that – it seems like a really good model. It sounds like you guys have really jumped in there uh, with something very similar. Uh, yeah, very similar. In fact, we have a program geared towards middle school students called uh, JA Finance Park. Uh, these are actual uh, site-based facilities, very Disney-esque in that you build this facility and inside you build storefronts that have names of real businesses that these kids see on the street every day. And so they will take through a J volunteer and educator in a classroom about a 13 week uh, course on managing money. But the ultimate capstone experience that they have at these facilities um, is they come in, uh, again, physical space. They're given a life situation card. So it may say that, Jeffrey, you are 28 years old. Uh, I have an. uh, under an Bless undergraduate you. undergraduate degree, couple kids, here's how much money you make. And then you have to actually go through this little town to figure out where am I going to live? How am I going to pay for transportation? Am I going to buy a car? Am I going to you know be taking the bus? How much does food cost? And because these are brands these kids see every day, it's very real to them. You know, I'll give you an example. One uh, not an uncommon sight to see in these facilities is a young lady or a young man with tears in her eyes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you think, golly, first reaction is what happened. But then as you talk to them, the, you'll hear things like, gee, I didn't recognize the sacrifices that my mom had to make for me. Uh, you'll see things as they're leaving these centers, a uh, chalkboard. What was your biggest takeaway today? 
well, I know I'm never going to have kids. They're too expensive. So it's that real <laughs> life experience that drives this home to them. Yeah, it's so important. I, and you know, you mentioned the volunteers. What about the uh, the board and the corporate sponsors? Because you can't do this without the commitment of the corporate community. I would I would imagine. I mean, you've got a great. Uh, I don't know what the right word is, a plethora of companies that support the initiative initiatives. Yeah, that's correct. And it's interesting over time, uh, our, our support has broadened. I mean, when I first got involved, uh, with junior achievement back in the 1970s, a lot of manufacturing firms were heavily engaged more and more the financial services company because of the financial literacy part of what we do are very involved. So here in the United States, we're raising about $190 million a year uh, collectively through those 106 offices uh, to make this happen. Wow. And again, that army of volunteers, a quarter, just think about that, a quarter of a million uh, volunteers that are, are going into the schools. And so one of the benefits, other than the pure learning that's taking place, is these kids are exposed to careers that may cause them to want to come to work at one of these places. Uh, a recent survey of our alumni showed that one out of every five, now think about that, so 20% of the students that are in JA end up in the same field of work as the volunteer they had coming into their classroom. That's a great step and a great, uh, you know, getting, I, you know, so much of this, Jack, is getting kids on the right path early um, to be financially independent. And I think without financial independence, you know, you, you're beholden to someone else. And if you don't have that, it's so disconcerting in so many different aspects of life to be able to achieve that. And then to learn through a volunteer and to follow a similar path to an organization. I think that's absolutely amazing. Last, last question. How, do, how does someone who's listening to the program today become a volunteer? Can they become a volunteer? I'm, I'm assuming there's a very stringent process to become a volunteer because obviously you're dealing with children, young people. Um, but how does someone do that? Well, most of our volunteers are brought to us through the companies in local communities, but we have a lot of parent volunteers as well. And so uh, I would suggest anybody that's interested in either being a volunteer or trying to determine how can I get my child into junior achievement is to go to our website which is real simple. It's uh, www.ja.org. Uh, and on that site, it uh, has a map of the United States, and you basically plug in your zip code, and it will connect you or give you contact information uh, for an office in that community. And then on top of that, for parents, they can find a whole lot of good age-appropriate information of how would they teach their kids about managing money uh, on that site so they could actually get started on their own. Yeah, I'm excited. because I, I love talking about this because, as you know, we just had uh, at the end of December, we just had an appropriations bill which included some significant retirement changes. And so near and dear to my heart is people saving for retirement. But it starts early. And we we're actually talking about I was at a panel today moderating the panel. And we we're talking about how we need to engage young people to get them thinking about all these important issues, and it sounds like you and JA and your board and your corporate partners and your volunteers are doing that. Jack, it's a pleasure talking to you, and look, I want to have you back on the program uh, and even back on our television network when the time is right, when you, can, you have time in your schedule. But we certainly appreciate you having on the program today and uh, look forward to all the great results that you and Junior Achievement are achieving. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Jack, that was amazing, and uh, I will send you and Ed. Uh, is, this will air a week from Sunday. Um, oh, super. And uh, I will send it to you, and then please, uh, if, if the time allows, I would love to uh, include you on our television network because we are growing. We're doing some things that are just absolutely amazing, um, and maybe there's opportunities to work together with you all in some capacity down the road. So Yeah, that would, that would be great. Uh, when we come to – Financial Literacy Month, we do a lot of surveys and sure. end up with a whole bunch of data. So, you know, there might be additional content uh, there that you'd be interested in. Absolutely. I mean, have Ed or whomever, or you can reach out to me. Uh, you guys have an open 
slot. So whenever you need to come on, let me know, um, and we'll, we'll, we can have you on. But again, we'd love to have you on either on both podcasts and uh, television. So. Well, that's that's very generous of you. Thank you so much. All right, man. have a great weekend. All right, you too. Thanks, Take buddy. care. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. And I want to shift gears, talk a little personal finance, yes. uh, which is obviously very important. It's one of the reasons why we have the program. And joining me on the line is um, a new contributor, uh, Mr. Greg Iacurchi. He is a personal finance reporter with CNBC. But many of you probably remember Greg from some other publications he has worked for. Greg, great to hear your voice. Great to talk to you again. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, well, you always do great work and big fan of the folks over at CNBC uh, for all the great coverage that they do. And I know you're, uh, you're a recent acquisition or a recent new teammate of the organization, but um, wish you all the best and always enjoy your great writing. So let's, let's jump right into it. I know um, a couple stories that you wanted to cover that really piqued my interest um, and I think will pique the audience's interest as well. Uh, let's just dive right into the coronavirus and um, – the impact, potential impact, I should say, on retirement accounts. I know you wrote a big story on that. Yeah, uh, earlier this week we published something about the coronavirus in relation to the recent market sell-off. Um, you know, a lot of people who are planning to retire in the near future, even some people who retired recently, might might have looked at what the stock market's done of late and and been wondering, well, what does this mean for me? Um, you know, the week of February 24th, two weeks ago, it was the worst week for stocks since the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the S&P 500 is now down, the last I looked, about 9% for the year. Mm. Um, so that means, you know, um, a saver with all their money in an S&P 500 mutual fund, for example, would have lost about 9% of their, their value since the beginning of the year. Um, now, granted, uh, you know, people who are close to retirement don't have all their money in, in stocks, most likely. But, you know, given increasing lifespans, a retiree probably has, you know, maybe 40 to 50 percent of their portfolio in stocks. So we're likely exposed to the recent sell off. Um, so we, we examined that and, um, you know, what people should be considering, how should, how they should be reacting to what's happened in the stock market. So, you know, in terms of, obviously there's a lot of reaction. I, I was just watching something, I think on your network early in the week on the television network early in the week where you had someone from a light on, I think Rob Austin from a light was on talking about all the, um, activity, the 401k trading hey, activity. Sir. And, uh, obviously that's very, very significant. I mean, selling now, Greg, probably not the best time to do that, especially when the market's down, you lock in your losses, but what, what, what can you do? I mean, you've been exploring this. What, what can people out there listening who are close to retirement do? Yeah. For people close to retirement, um, it's unfortunately a case of it, it's kind of too late to do anything to the loss aspect, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but, and people, people might not want to hear this, but, um, Working longer is kind of um, a silver bullet, if you will, the, according to the experts that I spoke to. Um, you know, even if you're able to work for an extra year or two, even do work part time when you retire, um, that's a great way to sort of reduce the impact that the stock market sell off may have had on your portfolio um, because it allows you some extra time to build up your savings and avoid tapping your investment portfolio. And it also um, helps you do some other beneficial things from a financial standpoint, like delay take, uh, claiming social security, for mm -hmm. example. Um, so that seems like the best thing you could do, even if you work just a little bit longer. Um, and, but if you don't want to work longer, or maybe, you know, you can't because your health is, is in poor condition, um, or, you know, got to bid, you lose your job, um, you may have to try increasing the money you're saving now or just be prepared to reduce your spending in retirement if your portfolio hasn't recovered by the time that you do retire. And actually, um, well, I was going to make the comment that I think 
I was going to go there with you, and that was my next question to you, Greg, is that the other alternative is to reduce your expenses. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and this is not uh, – you know, I'm old enough to remember the 2008 financial crisis. I'm sure you do as well. Uh, there were people kind of in that same situation, and I, I don't want to say that they're, they're, they line up. They're not the same. Right, the financial crisis was really significant in a lot of ways, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but you know, we're as you said, nine percent off the S and P. Um, you know, I think I think people who are near retirement have to be concerned, and so you have to be prepared for a multitude of things, as you're suggesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, during the financial crisis, people saw more than half of their stock portfolios erased in value. I mean, that was incredibly substantial. We're not we're obviously not there yet. We don't know how things are going to play out with the coronavirus um, in terms of its economic impact ultimately. Um, but you know, one other thing that people could could do or should try to do if they're retiring is they should avoid drawing from their stock investments if they can, mm-hmm. or areas of their portfolio like cash and bonds as they as they look to see if stocks recover. And that's due to the phenomenon uh, called sequence of return risk. Um, so basically, if the market, um, you know, goes down in value as it has uh, recently, and an investor is pulling money from their investments at the same time that the market's declining in value, that doesn't leave as much runway for those stocks to recover when the market ultimately goes back up. Um, so an investor who's pulling money from stocks when the market is going down is um, basically at a higher risk of outliving their money than somebody who is pulling money from their investments when the market is going up, for example. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Greg, I want to, you know, you have covered the retirement industry for a long time, and we saw the passage of the SECURE Act. One of the, thing, one of the provisions or several of the provisions are around lifetime income. Do you think that creates an opportunity? We've seen fixed interest annuity sales really uh, pick up over the last year over year. Annuity sales in general have been up year over year. But do you think that just the market downturn, um, just in talking to people you're talking to, this creates real opportunity for the use of annuities or annuity-like products in, in, in savings? Because if I'm close to retirement, you know, um, that may make sense for a portion of all of my – Yeah. Account. I think if, if nothing else, um, I mean, the, the, what the stock market has done recently might have people reconsidering their appetite for loss in their mm-hmm. portfolio. And for those people um, who might want to get a little more conservative, an annuity is certainly an option. Um, the good thing about an annuity is that um, basically they provide a steady stream of income. So at, in their simplest form, uh, an investor hands over a pot of money, let's say $100,000, and an in, insurance company says, okay, based on that, we can give you X amount of money per month in retirement. Mm-hmm. So that's, And that's regardless of what happens in the stock market. So people may look to that and say now like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's a good idea. It, it's essentially like social security and like an additional social security payment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that, re, you know, people love every, every poll I've ever seen is people love the reliability of an annuity payment and that pension that none of us have, at least I don't have many, many people listening may have it have still have a pension, but many of us uh, folks do not have a pension and they want that uh, fixed payment, um, so to speak in retirement. Greg, I want to switch gears if we can. Um, You also wrote a piece on the bag bans. Uh, And just to kind of bring everyone up to speed, New York City and other cities around the country have started to ban plastic bags to protect protect the environment. But from your writing, there's actually a lesson to be learned in how consumers treat money from these bag bans. Yeah, this was was a fun piece to write. looking at behavioral finance and, um, you know, why some, so uh, New York state, for example, right. Like you said, Jeff, um, banned single use plastic bags last Sunday. And as part of that, they imposed a five cent fee 
to you paper bags in uh, some counties and cities like New York City. And I was interested in the concept of, well, why is such a small fee enough to, um, you know, prevent people from using single-use bags? Like in, in Los Angeles, for example, which imposed a similar type of uh, rule um, a couple of years ago, they, they saw a 94% reduction in single-use bag consumption. And internationally, bag fees have led to 50% to 90% reductions in uh, bag use. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what the, the answer sort of boils down to people love free things and tend to overconsume them, um, which is why something as trivial as a five cent bag fee, um, when bags are no longer free, people stop and think a little bit more about, well, should I really be using this? Do I need to use this? Um, and there's one interesting experiment um, that highlights this done by a uh, behavioral economist at Duke University. He was looking at um, students and, and chocolate. So in, in one experiment, this researcher offered lint chocolate for 26 cents to students and uh, Hershey kisses for one cent um, to students. And the buying behavior of both was split pretty evenly. But um, the behavior shifted pretty dramatically um, when the researcher lowered uh, the cost of each by one cent. So the Hershey Kiss was free, um, but the relative cost between both stayed the same. And 90% of students opted for the Hershey Kiss in, in that uh, research. Interesting. It sort of shows how, yeah, people really love free things. And there is an interplay here um, in finance and financial services. Um, you know, we saw a number of low cost brokerages like Charles Schwab offer commission free trading uh, recently. And Fidelity Investments began offering some quote unquote free index funds. Um, in 2018, and in both cases, uh, those companies saw um, a rush of new clients. And this is also a reason why um, many asset managers and financial advisors take their fees directly from client accounts instead of charging separately for them. It gives the perception that their services are free. Mm. Um, also, in politics, we see some of the Democratic uh, front runners like Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden um, advocating for financial transaction taxes to rein in high frequency traders. Um, similar concept here. They expect high frequency trades to to be reduced as a result of that. Yeah, really interesting. You know, I just think five cents going back to the whole bag analogy for a second. The five cents just doesn't seem like a high price to pay. For a bag, and I can tell you, like my wife and I, we reuse those bags. Um, we reuse those bags, and we actually put them in small trash cans where we clean up. We have two cats, where we clean up the the cat mess uh, in the litter box. So we are using them. But do you, do you think that? I mean, there's a. Do you think five cents is really going to deter people from getting a bag? I, I don't know. I just I don't know if they thought that one. Well, all the I mean. On the, I agree. I mean, on the face of it, it, it would seem like no, but but the data indicates that, yeah, there's actually a pretty dramatic consumer response hmm. to something as small as a five cent bag fee. Interesting. Interesting. I, I, I would never have, uh, I don't know. I mean, and I'm not, you know, not like I'm made of a gazillion dollars, but I'm just like, <laughs> Hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not lugging around a bag. I mean, you see me on the street. I, you know, I don't really carry bags around with <laughs> me, uh, to do that, but maybe I'll have to be more mindful of that in the future. Well, Greg, Always a pleasure chatting with you, and I really en enjoy your writing, and I know the audience does as well, and uh, always enjoy the work that CNBC does, so it's great to have you be part of the program, and I uh, look forward to having you back on from time to time as your, as your schedule and time permits. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate the opportunity. All right, bud. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye -bye. Take it easy.
Welcome back. Now it's time to talk a little real estate and joining me on the line is Market Watch's real estate and sometimes personal finance reporter because that's his one of his true loves as well, Mr. Jacob Passy. Hey Jacob, how are you? I'm doing well. It's been a busy week. Yeah, for a lot of reasons. You got corona, yeah. you got the markets, you got all this news going around, but um let's uh let's let's get into what's important, what's been top of mind for you and the folks over at Market Watch this week. Yeah, so uh, this week, the probably the biggest news for the Beats I cover is that um, mortgage rates fell to um, basically an all-time low. So the um, average rate for a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage fell to 3.29% for mm-hmm. this past week, uh, according to uh, Freddie Mac. Uh, and that's the lowest uh, rate for a 30-year loan that they've recorded since they've been tracking that data starting in 1971. So uh, for most people, um, this will certainly be the lowest rate uh, they have ever seen in their lifetime. Um, (laughs) And uh, and 15-year fixed uh, rate mortgage is even lower. Uh, the average rate for a 15-year fixed rate mortgage dropped this week to 2.79%, so well below 3%. Um, so, you know, lots of interesting stuff going on. I mean, lots of people um, have a really great opportunity right now to refinance. Um, you know, if you haven't refinanced since the last time that uh, mortgage rates fell to an an, an all time average low was back in uh, 2012. Uh, so, and back then they were the average was 3.31 uh, percent. So, oh. you know, if you haven't refinanced uh, since then, um, you <clears throat> certainly will get a lower rate if you refinance now. Um, and uh, yeah, there's you know there are millions of people nationwide who could stand to benefit. Uh, the the thing to keep in mind though is rates don't stay low for long. Um, you know most people I spoke with said that they don't necessarily expect rates to go much lower. Um, I I actually got to interview the CEO of Quicken Loans this week, and mm. he said he does not expect rates to go below three percent, like the average for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. He does not expect that to drop below three percent at least this time around uh, this cycle. So, um, and and what I'm hearing from economists and lenders, including uh, uh, Jay Farner, the CEO of Quicken Loans, is a big issue for lenders right now is capacity. You know, they don't have enough staff to handle all the applications that they're getting right now. Um, and they're hesitant to hire more people to handle more impl- applications because, you know, what's going on in the, in the mortgage market right now is directly tied to the coronavirus and concerns of how the coronavirus will affect the economy. Um, and, you know, that's caused the Fed to cut rates this week. It caused the 10-year Treasury to drop to an all-time low. It caused sell-offs in the stock market. So, you know, when this situation clears up uh, or we get more certainty on what's going on, um, pretty much all everyone I've spoken with has said, you know, mortgage rates will probably go back up again um, mm-hmm. because, you know, once there's certainty, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, there's a very clear factor here driving rates down. So lenders, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to hire more people if they're thinking this is going to just be a short-term blip. You know, if in three weeks from now, rates shoot back up to where they were at the start of the year, uh, that's going to significantly cut down on the number of people who are interested in a refinance. And then if you've hired a bunch of new people, then you're having to think of layoffs and, you know, other things like that. Um, and anecdotally, we, I, a colleague of mine had heard from a mortgage broker that um, – Banks are actually now starting to increase rates uh, because they don't have the staff to handle the low rates. So basically, you know, banks are trying to almost dissuade people from applying for a refinance right now because uh, they just don't have the bandwidth to, to handle all these applications. So uh, what that means is if you uh, – think you might benefit from a refinance, you should get an application out sooner rather than later, contact lenders ASAP, lock down a rate with one of them. Um, That's something that's really important, you know, uh, especially if rates do go back up, you want to lock in the low rate now. And if you lock in the low rate now, you can always talk to the lender later on if, you know, when it comes closer to the time to close, if the rates go back down or go down even lower, then you can talk about relocking at the lower rate. Yeah, Jacob. So, well, I was going to yeah. ask you, what what does this mean for banks in terms of the cost of us of lending money? Is, I mean, it's 
I mean, how do you make money if you're a bank? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm, that's and that's the other. That's I mean, that's one of the other big factors why you know banks are you know lenders are saying that you know don't and economists are saying don't expect rates to go much lower than they are now because at a certain point banks need to keep their margins uh, uh, good and you know they need to turn a profit and the way banks turn a profit is you know it's two parts it's the fees associated with the loan but it's also the interest and you know the right now you know it. It's unclear how bad of an impact the coronavirus outbreak is going to have on the economy. Um, so, you know, if it does have a larger economic impact, if we start seeing people lose their jobs as a result of the outbreak, or, you know, if people stop spending, you know, stop buying goods because uh, they're sheltered up at home and they're not going out shopping, you know, if, if we start to see some of those ripple effects become more significant, um, then, you know, then there would be more of an, you know, an economic reason, you know, mm-hmm. a, a macroeconomic reason for rates to be low. Um, and so, you know, I mean, r- there's an extent to which banks drop rates because they want to attract buyer uh, lenders or borrowers, sorry. Uh, but there's also an extent <laughs> to which they drop rates uh, because uh, you know they they have to follow the market. Um, you know the, the the other consideration for banks is they package these loans into mortgage-backed securities, or they sell them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who package them into mortgage-backed securities. And the interest rate on the loans guides you know kind of the yield on the security. And if uh, bond yields are more attractive for other investments rather than mortgage-backed securities, those won't sell well. So that's another consideration lenders have to make. Lots goes into the the decision making when it comes to setting rates. But, um, you know, yeah, so so lenders are, are hesitant to, to drop rates even lower. I mean, given where the 10-year Treasury is at, it dropped below 1% for the first time ever. Uh, right now, uh, we're talking on Friday, and it's at 0.75 percent. You know, this is crazy low. So certainly, you know, lenders would be. There is justification to drop mortgage rates even lower based on the 10-year Treasury because that's you know one of their, their guideposts in setting rates. But uh, these other factors are kind of what's keeping them from doing that. Jacob, we've talked many times on the show about the inventory for housing. Housing starts. Uh, what does this do to? the potential for housing starts or is there even an impact to housing starts and and trying trying to fill some of that inventory yeah, so you know, there's definitely, um, you know, the, a lot of the focus obviously is on you know the refinance boom this is causing, but you know, there's definitely a large extent to which it's uh, you know making buying a home more affordable for people. So it is, you know, there is a growing uh, population of Americans who can now afford to buy a home in large part because rates are so low, um, and you do see applications for loans to purchase a home increasing as well. Not quite as much as refinancing, but uh, but still they're increasing according to data from the Mortgage Bankers Association. So, um, you know, that will be positive for, for home builders. There's mm-hmm. still really significant demand out there. Um, and so they'll continue to buy homes one, or build homes. One question I put out to uh, economists this week when um, rates oh. dropped to an all-time low, and I think you and I have discussed this before, is, um, you know, this idea of people who were or rate locked into their home. So there yep. was this kind of, there's this, you know, theory that the jury's out on whether it's really true, but there was this theory that, you know, a lot of people are stuck in their homes more or less because uh, they have this super low interest rate and that makes it that much harder to justify, you know, spending money to buy a new home and sell your existing one because it's that much more expensive once you factor everything in. Um, so I asked, you know, with rates now hitting all time lows, you know, is that going to cause some people to think, you know, hey, maybe I will sell now after all, you know. And the kind of consensus that I got was, um, you know, there, that might happen on the margins. Um, this might encourage people to sell sooner than they were otherwise anticipating, but it's not really going to cause all that many people to um, want to sell. Um, and another issue that, you know, everyone in the real estate industry is going to be looking at builders, realtors, mortgage lenders is, you know, how concerns about the coronavirus affect consumer confidence because, you know, a home is easily the largest purchase you'll probably make in your entire life. Um, And, you know, people are going, you know, if this situation gets dicier, if people are getting nervous about their job, if, you know, if the economy is in the tank, you know, that 
if that those t things happen, there will be an effect on on you know demand. You know, people will be less inclined to buy, and and you know the timing of this is not great if that happens because we're heading into the spring home buying season, which is the most top popular time of year to buy a home. So, you know, there, there are some concerns in the background that, you know, we still don't know really what's going on with the outbreak. If it's, uh, you know, if it's slowing down, if it's speeding up, how severe is it really the, the virus? So, you know, all that, uh, could continue to play a role and, and, uh, potentially put a damper on the real estate market in the weeks to come. Yeah, well, more to come on that, Jacob. And I uh, know people are anxiously listening to the podcast, watching at the network, watching the stories that you are, and the, the team at Market Watch are doing. And I guess yeah. we just have to just to wait and see. So, Jacob, always a pleasure yeah. talking with you. And thanks so much for uh, uh, dropping by. I don't know if that's the right terminology, yeah. but enjoy your weekend. And we'll talk you to you again stay next healthy. week. I will. I'm going to stay in my apartment all weekend long. Yeah, self-quarantine. Yeah. That's the, the... <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye. Welcome back. And now we're going to shift gears, talk a little bit about yeah. legislation, regulation, litigation, all things in between. And joining me on the line, he's one half yeah. of the Legal Eagles, Kevin Walsh. He's a principal one, with one, the Groom two, Law Group, chartered. They're an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. Kevin, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well this week, Jeff. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, you, you really gave us a pretty strong lead in there with the litigation, legislation, <laughs> regulation. I mean, I, I, that might have been a bit of an oversell. I'm, I'm going to do what I can to, to come through this week. Well, you always come through. And, you know, just because your, your depth and breadth of your experience and, you know, what we cover on the network – from in your, in this segment in particular, there's a lot to, to talk about. So we, we don't have to hit all of those things, but I know that you wanted to talk about the Securities and Exchange Commission looking at mutual fund naming conventions, and in particular, ESG. What can you tell us there, Kev? Yeah, so uh, one thing that the SEC does is it regulates kind of the names you can use for funds. Uh, and this is part of Chairman Clayton's real focus on retail investors. Um, and just parts that focus, just a, a quick hit for, for listeners, you know, Reg BI that focuses on putting a best interest standard of care for brokers interacting with uh, customers, Form CRS, um, which is kind of a new disclosure for advisors and broker dealers uh, so that kind of retail customers can have a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, and now kind of Jay Clayton and the rest of the commission, um, which would be a great band name, uh, has turned to <laughs> fund naming rules. I like that. So, so – and when you look at the, the RFI, they make a pretty great point at the beginning, which is that fund names are the first place that investors look to um, in terms of figuring out what they're going to invest in. Um, and that, you know, while the SEC can, can merit lots of disclosures, uh, they can merit that they be easy to read, uh, not all investors even look that much further than just looking at the fund name. So what's in the RFI? Uh, it asks a whole bunch of questions about fund naming issues, and I mean – it relates to things like derivatives, index funds, hybrid products. But, yeah, our topic this week is as it relates to ESG. Mm. Um, and kind of the, the, the point that they make is that, you know, based on their data, uh, if we look back 12 years, there were only 65 funds that used terms like ESG, clean, environmental, impact, responsible, social, or sustainable in their names. So not a lot. If we look at the end of last year, <laughs> it went from 65 to 291. Oh, wow. So massive increase. And, and I think the commission's concerned that, you know, no one really has a, a great grasp on what ESG means. Uh, and the reason I say no one has a grasp on it is because the, uh, they describe ESG as being something that's subjective versus objective, mm -hmm. at least for the moment. And under their prior fund naming rules, uh, they tended to have restrictions on using objective measures. So the idea was you had to invest 80% of your assets in accordance with a strategy that was disclosed in your name. Um, so here, the SEC is trying to address this concern that, you know, we're seeing a proliferation of fund names that use ESG-related terms. Mm -hmm. um, and that absent some clear meaning or absent some clear understanding on the part of, of investors is what these mean – there could be a fair amount of confusion. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I, well, I was going to make the, just a comment that I think uh, consistent with 
kind of best practices with DC plans. I mean, it's it, a lot of a lot of it. A lot of the concern is communication, education, right, Kev, and and being able to understand and be astute in terms of understanding what these the objective of the fund is should, in some way, shape, or form, be tied to uh, the name of the fund. But that being said, ESG. I mean, that means different things to different people. So you may think of something as ESG or sustainable, and I may have a completely different thought process in that. And and I, I wonder how the SEC could possibly deal with, with with that. I mean, that seems tough to me. Well, so there's really two ways that they're looking at it. So the second is the easier, which is um, are ESG and sustainable really too vague? Um, should funds kind of instead of just using that describe themselves as as doing what component of ESG they're doing mm-hmm. um, rather than a broad thing. And that, you know, that that might help. But the other point they're making is that, and they're asking, because I, I think they're hoping for consensus here, is what do people want when they're investing in it? What do they think they're getting when they invest in ESG funds? So are the, the terms designed to be an indication um, that the fund invests or doesn't invest in certain things? Like it only invests in companies that are carbon neutral. You know, alternatively, it could mean that they're investing in companies that may or may not be carbon neutral, but in terms of using their shareholder influence, um, they're trying to use their shareholder influence to steer the companies they invest in mm-hmm. into a more ESG-friendly manner. And that, that's two whole different things. And then kind of a third uh, definition they throw out or a third way investors could view it is, you know, maybe these are funds that are foregoing economic opportunities. So they're, they're depressing their economic yield intentionally as a way of um, adding – kind of ESG goods to the world. So, uh, yeah, yeah, go, Jeff. I was going to just ask you. So this RFI comes out. They're asking for public informa- or information back from all the players in the universe. What's typically the timetable that one would expect for someone, for, for an entity like the SEC to take in all this information and then begin to formulate a response? I got to think that you're going to expect to get lots of different comments from lots of different players and it's going to be all over the place. So it's going to take some time, I guess is my point. So you're asking a great question and I'm, you know, there's really two ways they could go. Mm-hmm. And since it's the fund naming rule, um, I don't know if they're actually going to do rulemaking out of this. So typically when they've had new terms come out, uh, the SEC's released new FAQs on their website mm-hmm. addressing how to use this term and when you can and can't use a term. So while they could go the full rulemaking route, which takes longer, uh, they could just decide at the end of the comment period that, you know, an easier way to address this would be to put a couple of FAQs up, uh, and that could be done in a, in pretty short order. Yeah, um, I would imagine that um, there's going to be a lot of, like I said, a lot of respondents. So this is obviously a very, very hot topic. Uh, it looks like it's it's more than just like a little fly by night trend. This is a big deal. You've seen assets really flow as you as you alluded to uh flowed it flowing into these funds so clearly um there's an interest there and uh would it be let me you know just going back to you and and your colleague david levine sit in a lot of committee meetings um and their investment policy statements that get written is it something that is it too early for the plan sponsor for the institutional investor to think about how they defined esg so that maybe that can help frame funds to select, et cetera, or even responding to, on behalf of the employers, responding to um, this RFI? So in the ERISA space, there's been a lot of attention to ESG because um, the Department of Labor has put out guidance uh, reminding fiduciaries that their primary objective or their sole focus is supposed to be on maximizing the assets that participants have available for retirement. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think some of whether plans move in a more ESG-friendly manner could somewhat turn on the outcome of, of how the SEC chooses to kind of define ESG in the marketplace. Um, if ESG means depressed returns, I would expect plans to be a little bit more skeptical of considering these products. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if, if there's a case to be made that, you know, better governance means better outcomes um, and that you can clearly see which are the funds focused on better governance outcomes yeah. through the, the revised naming rules, then it wouldn't surprise me to see more committees focus on seeing if there's a way to incorporate more of these products in their plans. Yeah, really good, really good astute advice, Kevin. And I guess there's a lot more to be um, heard about not just what we were describing, but also the benchmarking and other other facets of of using these type of investment offerings. 
Well, Kevin, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the program. I know you have an incredibly busy travel schedule, and David as well. But we always appreciate you guys appreciate you guys stopping by to give us a little bit of insight into your world. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, you too. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, folks, that wraps up this episode of the BRN Sunday Podcast. Hope you found it uh, educational and entertaining all at the same time. You know, finance can be fun, of course. We talk about a lot of great issues. I want to thank our special guest, Jack Koskowski from the Junior Achievement. Great organization, doing great work, engaging young people in financial literacy. And of course, I want to thank our contributors and our great audience. So until next week, I'm Jeff Snyder. Keep on saving. and Don't forget, roll with those changes.